Thanks for staying with us. Our program today focusing on the 3rd Congressional District, the seat representing the southern middle part of the state, including the city of New Haven. And joining us right now, Republican candidate for Congress, Margaret Stryker. Thanks for being with us this morning. And thank you for having me. And before we go any further, congratulations on the birth of your new baby boy. Thank what you a very joy. much. Thank you. Absolutely. He's, he's a little sweetie pie. Glad to be back on the show. It's been a couple of months. All right, and so thank let's you get for right me. into it. Um, you know, we know that you're a businesswoman, that you're a mom of four. Give us your pitch to voters. You've never run for political office before, so who are you? Um, as you aptly said, I am a mother to four. I've been running my own businesses for 20 years now. Uh, I actually started as an entrepreneur as a very young age. Um, probably six years old was my first business. But um, I am a first-time candidate. I'm coming out of the real estate world where I've been running um, over a billion dollars with the real estate in New York and Connecticut and Arizona, Arkansas, North Carolina, Florida, Indiana, all over, do student housing, multifamily housing, and then associated commercial. Um, and I am here because we need change. Uh, after 30 years of constant decline in this district, we've had uh, one person in, in office who has nothing to show for it. We see uh, year after year exodus of jobs out, rising taxes, lower quality of life, uh, unaffordable health care, and um, certainly it's time for us to stand up and say no more. These are failed policies, uh, failed career politicians, and it's time to go. It's time to make a change. So I'm here. I'm trying. I would love the opportunity to serve my country, and I can think of no higher purpose for my life than to have the opportunity as a patriot to help work to and through so many of the issues that we're facing here in this country today. You are not taking on an easy person to unseat here, right? We have a 15-term incumbent in Congresswoman Rosa DeLauro. Her name recognition is huge in the area, in the state. Uh, we have seen your ads that are running. You've poured thousands of dollars into uh, getting your name out there. Uh, how do you combat the name recognition? How are you trying to get to voters? Um, well, I am getting to voters directly, and it is important that people know that they have a choice, a credible choice. I am both the Republican and the independent candidate for Congress. I am running a um, transparent campaign, which is just saying, here's who I am. Uh, like, come to the table. There are options this time. Uh, she was elected when I was 14 years old. I will have uh, essentially almost a 15-year-old come election day. She'll be a couple weeks away. And this multi-generational career politician uh, do nothing, get nothing accomplished for our district, it's got to go. Let's talk about your ads that are running and some of the content in your ads. First of all, I know that you had uh, put out a claim there that people are sick of politicians lining their pockets and you show a picture of Rosa DeLauro. Explain what you mean by that. Well, my ads in initially introduced me to the public, and as I mentioned before, approximately 90-plus percent of my campaign uh, is going towards direct voter outreach. Um, but it's been reported in multiple uh, news organizations. I believe the LA Times, the Chicago Tribune, I believe Politico. Many of them talk about how she and her husband have this uh, somewhat curious cyclical nature, uh, how she gave five years of free housing to uh, a very high insider inside of the Obama initiation, excuse me, administration, and um, some of perhaps the benefits that came from that. Uh, and it smells like D.C. at its worst. I want to make sure you have time to respond to some of the things that she said in this last okay. segment. So she had said, uh, she threw some punches here, that you're a slumlord. She said that you were fined by the New York Attorney General for some of your real estate uh, as, as a landlord, um, for some of the interactions there, and that you are ranked, apparently, one of the worst landlords, allegedly, in New York. I want to give you a chance to respond to that. Oh, well, it's funny because she's already had her people trying to do this to me on Facebook and so forth. So in, in the first instance, um, she's wrong. I testified in a uh, DOI investigation, which is a essentially a internal affairs against corrupt politicians uh, in New York City. And the retaliation, if it will, and it was thanked in the paper, was uh, to do that to me. So that was also 15 some odd years ago. So it's absolutely insane. Uh, in the second regard, uh, we can also look at who 
the attorney general was, and that was Eric Schneiderman, who um, very shortly thereafter was forced to resign within 24 hours after his abuse of women, many of whom looked shockingly like myself, uh, came to light. So we can look at that for what that is as well. And once again, there was no finding of any wrongdoing. Uh, I did pay a fine uh, simply to make it go away. But um, really, uh, I think she's defensive. And I think she knows that she is running into a situation where she can't bully her way through it. And in many cases, what one has to do to a bully is stand up and say no more, uh, which is why we are standing up. And it's not me. It is all of us here in Connecticut in this district who are saying no more. We are tired of this. It is time for someone who can represent us and our values and our ideals and who wants to work, who wants to work hard, who wants to deliver for the people. Because after 30 years, when you've only passed uh, nine bills, and I believe many of them have to do with naming post offices, it's time to go. She also called you a clone of the president, a clone of Donald Trump with his real estate uh, interactions. Your reaction to that? Um, yes, we are both in real estate. Uh, I certainly am not the president of the United States. I certainly have not achieved so much of what he has achieved. Uh, and I am an independent minded person with certainly a mind of my own. So I'm not sure exactly what she's implying by that. but. Um, it is what it is, I guess. I think she was implying that the president has been uh, accused of being a bad landlord in New York City. And so she was attributing that and saying um, that you were in that category is what I was taking from it. Um, OK, let's talk about the president. Uh, you say you're an independent voter. Uh, how do you think he's handled the COVID-19 pandemic? Um, well. I think that, well, let me back up. My heart goes out to everyone who has suffered from this disease uh, and who has, you know, died from this. And it's it's tragic. And I have a 99-year-old grandmother. I have aging parents. Uh, I, I do fully appreciate some of the difficulties that many people are going through with this. Uh, and we can't stop until it is properly addressed. And if that comes in the form of vaccine, I'm all about that. Um, I also do believe very, very much so that it's important to weigh the the risks of what we are doing to society, what we are doing to the economy, and what we are doing uh, to the kind of social networks, uh, certainly as it pertains to children with the mental health issues and as it pertains to adults. Uh, I think there's a collateral associated with this, and we really do have to pay attention and weigh and balance all of this. So as I understand it, many in the, you know, far left radical are saying it's a binary decision. You know, either you're for this disease or you're against this disease, which is sheer nonsense. It's about balance and it's about how to safely and securely get back to work, get back to business, get back to our, you know, robust economy, get back to having our children in school, getting back to socialization, et cetera. So how do you think the president has handled the pandemic so far? Um, I think that he has handled it under extraordinary duress. Um, I will also point out that the incumbent, uh, who I'm challenging, Rosa DeLauro, was, uh, I believe, uh, mentioned in Politico as having thrown such a temper tantrum using profanity, et cetera, that both Republicans and Democrats walked out of a uh, meeting dealing with appropriating monies to address the pandemic back in February before it came as bad as it was. So he has handled everything as best as he could. And I do believe in the sovereignty of the states. And so therefore, the governors do have responsibility to lead. And in that regard, certainly, um, Ned Lamont has not done all that he could or should have. What do you think Ned Lamont could have done better? Uh, for one, he should have allowed the legislature to remain together and had some public hearings about the conversations and so on, rather than simply acting as um, commander in chief, which he is not, and um, doing a full shutdown without any regard. His phased uh, rollouts of how things open from the hair salons to everything else was a kind of a rolling train wreck around here. And um, it has caused additional um, problems insofar as our economy cannot regrow. And small businesses, certainly around here, small businesses are the backbone of our economy. And it's unnecessary to do what he did without any regard for the science in terms of, you know what, let me back that up. 
I think he intended to follow the science, but I think as it rolled out, it wasn't necessarily. So one day you can use hair dryers, the other day you can't. Some days you can, you know, go to a restaurant and if you're eating food, it's okay. But if you're drinking alcohol, it's not. It was just, it was very haphazard and it wasn't really uh, thought out perhaps in terms of the practical uh, talking about the governor right now, we know he ruffled some feathers with his police accountability bill. Police unions, uh, you know, not happy necessarily with that bill. And you've actually gotten the support of half a dozen police unions, including from the city of New Haven, the police union there. Uh, how did that come about? And tell us, you know, what you think about that. Uh, well, I have always had a huge respect for all first responders. I have worked with them throughout my career. I actually have partners that are former uh, first responders. And um, I've reached out, and I've been reaching out the entire time before even the notion of being endorsed. I am proud and humbled to have been endorsed by so many, including the Fraternal Order of Police at the statewide level, which is the first time a federal candidate in this district has ever been endorsed by one. Um, and I reached out to the unions. I've reached out to the police chiefs and said, you know, what can I do? Uh, what, how can I help? And what are your needs? Uh, and we've had many conversations, spent many hours on the phone, and it's... Um, something I look forward to living up to their expectations when I get to Washington. What do you tell people who are living, for example, in the city of New Haven, who attended Black Lives Matter rallies that were peaceful in our state, thankfully, uh, and they sit there and they say they're worried about equality and justice under the law in their city, because you would obviously represent them too. What do you say to them? Uh, I certainly believe in equality under the law. I believe in equal access um, through individual hard work and diligence. And I'm proud to have run companies which have been uh, lauded uh, both as a employer and under fair housing for having reached and exceeded many standards across that metric. Um, it is certainly something that I hold dearly. It's a principle that people have heard me talk about for many, many years. Um, and we should all be working towards a more equitable and um, open society. But I don't know that this is an either or, uh, and, and many people are trying to make it one. It's not. Uh, we can be both. We can be open-minded, open to all you know, ages, races, genders, etc., while still supporting our police, while still supporting our military, and still respecting the laws of this country. Margaret, we only have about 20 seconds left, but quickly, I know you've uh, criticized Rosa DeLora for being in office for so long. Are you in favor of term limits, even if you're elected? Absolutely. Do you Absolutely. have a certain number of terms that you think someone should serve and then not be able I, to? I believe uh, that it should be eight years in the House of Congress, and if one rises to leadership, and there is something to be said for seniority, then they should be eligible, assuming they win their elections, for an additional four years. But certainly, if they can't rise to leadership, as the incumbent has not, um, then after eight, it's time to go home. And if one has, then after 12, that's still plenty in my book. All right. Candidate for Congress, Republican Margaret Stryker, thank you so much for your time. We appreciate it. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. It's been wonderful. That's going to do it for us on The Real Story. If you want to watch these segments again, you can check out fox61.com or check out the Fox 61 News app. Make sure you join us every Sunday at 10 a.m. Have a great morning.